Wow. And I thought that the Washington Wizards game was really bad. But <laughs> then there's this game tonight. Conservative new media viewers and Jeremy Lin fans around the world, what is going on? We are here to go over Houston's 110-107 to last-second home loss to the visiting Milwaukee Bucks. With the loss, Houston drops to 31-28 and on the year, and the Rockets have lost two games in a row. What happened in this game was that Milwaukee kind of hung around. Houston didn't put them away, even though they had the 17-point early lead, did the Rockets. Milwaukee hung around, hung around, hung around, and they kind of found their groove. I could tell early on after Houston gave up that lead that this was going to be a tough game. This is going to be a close game. And this happens. Now, Milwaukee's not a bad team. They're at 500 for the year after winning this game at 28 and 28, and they're also 14 and 14 on the road. It's pretty good if you can go even or above on the road. That's a sign of a pretty good team. And so Milwaukee's no joke. This isn't like losing to the Wizards with their record, although Washington is better than their record. So, uh, got to give Milwaukee credit and respect. Uh, they have some real shooters on their team. Don Levy, J.J. Redick, uh, guys can hit shots for them. Uh, tonight was Demo Donatus Mateunis' first start. He had a good numbers in this game. And also Thomas Robinson, the main piece of the trade with the Sacramento Kings, he got his first action tonight. Now, the new guys were good, particularly Demo. Thomas Robinson had foul trouble, didn't get to do a lot in this game. However, what happened for Houston was that the new guys kind of disrupted Houston's offensive flow and some on defense. And what what the reason why that happened was even if you're good, you still got to get used to everybody. And so Demo is trying to get used to playing with all the guys on the first offensive team. And it kind of clogged down the offense, which is why later in the game you saw Mikhail go with, with Delfino at the power forward, even though Demo was playing well because that unit knows each other. And they they're played with one another, and so there's more fluidity on the offense. And you didn't have that when Demo was in, or when Thomas Robinson was in, because the guys just aren't used to one another. Uh, Houston's defense was not good enough in this game. Now a lot of it was their own fault. Some of it is that again, Milwaukee has very good shooters, particularly Don Levy and JJ Redick. So. Those guys were hitting shots, and it's tough. You can have guys you think they're covered, but these guys can hit shots. And when Monte Ellis gets hot, he can hit shots. So that happened tonight. Omer Ashik had an excellent game, 16 points and 22 rebounds, which is a new career high for him in rebounds. Demo had 13 points seven boards, and five assists in 26 minutes. That's very good. He had just, he's so talented. It's incredible. He is really going to be a great player. As I mentioned, Thomas Robinson was in foul trouble. He got three fouls in the first half and just wasn't able to really get a rhythm in this game. The only thing, I'm kind of calm right now, and the reason why I'm shocked because that the ending, the, the basically Monte Ellis hit a falling away three-pointer at the last second of this game. And it looked like it was going to overtime. And he just hit this kind of desperation, just heave that you'll be seeing on the highlight loops tonight and for a long time. And, you know, it was like, whoa. You didn't think he was going to hit it. That's a shot that a guy will miss nine out of ten times, but it, he hit it. It went off the backboard, I think, and hit the rim, and it went in. So it's it's kind of a shock. And Utah's losing tonight. And I've mentioned before in these videos that 
Houston has to hold off the Lakers. But they don't have to hold off the Lakers if Utah falls out of the playoff chase. Utah is in a very vulnerable spot. If any team's going to fall out of the playoffs, it's going to be Utah before Houston. So they're very good at home, Utah is. They just lost their last game at home, and they might lose again tonight at home. So if they start crumbling, then Houston's going to be in great shape, even if L.A. keeps winning. So I'm kind of comforted by that. If Utah loses tonight, Houston's only a half a game back of them. And right now, after this loss to Milwaukee, Houston is two and a half games up on the Lakers. Milwaukee's bench outplayed Houston's bench. Again, that was Dunleavy, Redick, these guys. Another exciting thing about tonight, again, is this is absolutely the most talented this team has been this year. They've got really good players at every single position, and they've got good depth players at every single position. I've mentioned this before. The ideal situation is that you have guys that can come off the bench and extend the lead, not just hold it and hope everything's okay, but extend it. Now you've got Beverly, um, Delfino, Garcia slash uh, James Anderson, Thomas Robinson, and Greg Smith, plus the new guy that I said was signed, and his name is Tim Olbrecht, I believe he's from Germany, I think. Now you've got really quality depth. This is by far the deepest and best this team has been. But they're all still young. And as I mentioned earlier, now you've got guys that have to get used to new, to other guys. You've got Robinson, Olbrecht, Demo. They've got to get used to playing with everybody else. And that's going to take time. Look, as, as I mentioned, Houston is ahead of schedule this year. The, the, the main objective for them this year is make the playoffs. If they make the playoffs... That's big. That's success. And so we want them to you know, get as high as they can in the standings, but if they just make the playoffs, that's successful. And they're going to get a lot better. They have so much talent, they're going to get much better. And we all know that, that they're going to go after guys this offseason. I think they still are very close to having the ability to offer a full maximum level contract to somebody upcoming this year. And that's how you score the best free agents. So they're in great shape, even though this loss was unfortunate, and so was the Wizards' loss. As they just have to stay healthy and keep working and keep keep um, keep expanding their individual skills and working at, to come together as a unit. And, and they're doing that. They're doing that. Jeremy played well in this game, but he was a little bit off with his shooting. And uh, let's talk about that now. Okay, Jeremy played a solid game, uh, quite solid in my opinion. I, I thought he played pretty well in this game. He looked a lot better than he did in the Wizards and Brooklyn game physically. He didn't look sick tonight, so that's good. That's an improvement by itself. Uh, first thing you have to do when you're sick is get healthy before you can try to think about how you're performing in the game. And he looked good that way tonight. He had 10 points, 3 rebounds, 7 assists. He played 33 minutes, shot 4 of 11 from the field, was 0 of 2 on 3-point attempts, was 2 of 2 from the free throw line. He had 3 steals, 1 block shot. He had 2 turnovers, 1 foul. His plus-minus was plus 1. And his efficiency number was 15. So the overall stat line is solid. The only thing that stands out is that he was 4 of 11 from the field. But a number of those shots were in close, and they were floaters and runners. And sometimes you're going to make them, and sometimes you're not going to make them. And as I've said recently, those are the things, if, if there was one thing I would tell Jeremy to work on, 
that's what I would tell him to work on. And he's he's working at it. It takes time to get really good at those shots. And again, when he was in college, he didn't have to shoot like that because he could he could beat the guys he was going against, including the second defender. But now he's going against taller uh, guys that jump higher and jump quicker. So now he's got to change his game. And he will, and he is. But it's going to take time. And, and sometimes you're just going to miss those shots. And so even though he didn't shoot a good percentage, I don't have really any problem with his shooting tonight. He, um, he put shots up that he should have shot. Just didn't make them. Uh, Jeremy played better than his op- opposing point guard, Brandon Jennings. And on the final drive of the game where, where Monte Ellis got the shot, Brandon Jennings isolated against Jeremy one-on-one, but Jeremy stopped him. And that's why Jennings had to pass it to Monte, and Monte just threw the ball up and it went in. But Jeremy played great defense on that, even though Brandon Jennings was trying to take him one-on-one. Jeremy stopped him, and that's really good. Okay, let's go through some quarter by quarter. Early in the first quarter, Jeremy made a mistake that that, that is common, and I've pointed it out before, and it just it's a very basic thing that's taught to all players. Don't jump to pass. And he did that. He jumped to pass, and it was very close to a turnover. He, he lucked out because it wasn't a turnover because I think it went off of a Milwaukee guy's hands out of bounds. But it's a common mistake. The guys know they're not supposed to do that, but it still happens. And he'll get better with it. It's, again, it's he'll get better with it. That's that's easy. He doesn't do it very much anymore. He used to do it a whole bunch. He did a lot last year, and he did a lot early this year. Now he doesn't do it very often. But, again, you you don't want to jump to pass because if you do, then you have to pass before you come down or you travel. You don't want to be in that position. You only have a split second to make a pass. So if you go up to pass and all of a sudden your guy's covered, you're out of luck. What are you going to do? So... That's why you don't want to do it. Okay, also early in the first, Jeremy had a nice pass across the court, like on a diagonal. Jeremy was at the top right of the three-point arc on the right-hand side. And he threw it a diagonal pass down to the left-hand corner three-point arc to Demo for a left, for left corner three. That was a great play. That was a really good recognition and vision by Jeremy to see Demo. And it was a great shot by Demo. Again, I mean, the guy has all the skills. He can shoot. He can play inside. He can pass, etc. Okay, Jeremy, in the in also early in the first, with eight minutes and five seconds left, went down the right-hand side of the lane and put a really high floater over Larry Sanders, who was a great shot blocker. He might even lead the league in blocks. So this was, you know, we've talked about when Jeremy will struggle and one of the conditions is against a great shot blocker. Well, Larry Sanders is about as good as it gets, at least this year. Um, That shot was a teardrop. We've talked before. I said floaters, runners, teardrop. And as I mentioned, a teardrop is a really high floater with a whole bunch of arc. That was a teardrop shot. Now, you can call it a floater, but it's the type of shot that could also be called a teardrop, and and that's what it looks like. So if you see on the highlights or you watch the game, eight minutes and five seconds left, Jeremy went down the lane, hit that shot to make it 16-4. to four. That's what a teardrop shot looks like. Uh, middle of the first quarter, Jeremy... Um, in transition, went down on the left-hand side of the lane, went in for a left-handed layup. He missed it, but he was found, shot two free throws, and made both of them. Also in the middle of the first, Jeremy was in transition at right about at half court, and his man was up on him trying to stop him. Jeremy had a nice little behind-the-back pass to Chandler Parsons at midcourt, for a Chandler Parsons 
easy dunk. That was a great pass and great play by Jeremy. And it was the only play he really had because of the angle that the defender was giving him. Um, also, middle of the first, Jeremy drove from the right-hand side of the court, went through the lane like a Steve Nash thing, navigate through the lane, keep your dribble alive. Then he had a nice little pass down to Omer Ashik for a big dunk. And that was great. Uh, it was a great play all the way around. And we've talked before. I've said it a number of times. Jeremy's got to find Omer in spots where Omer can dunk. Well, that's exactly what he did. And he did it after going through the lane and drawing all the attention on him, which is why Omer was open in the first place. It was just a great play. Late. I, I, well, let me just say this, actually. Demo had a very nice play himself in the middle of the first. He started on the right-hand side of the court, and I mentioned this in, I believe, the last video, the the term of drive, draw, and dish. So you drive, you beat your man. Because you've beaten your man, someone else's defender has to come up and stop you. That's that. So you drive, you draw the other defender, and then you dish the ball, you pass the ball to the guy whose defender left him. And that's exactly what Demo did. He went on, starting from the right-hand side of the court, close to like the, the right-hand corner, drove in, beat his guy, drew the, the whoever it was, uh, probably Larry Sanders, and did just nice little pass to Omer for a dunk. As I said, for a guy that's seven foot tall and 22 years old to be able to do that and do it that well, that's pretty remarkable. I said, I mean, Demo is, uh, once he gets in sync with the first team, he just gets a, he needs a little bit more experience. You know, he's making some plays tonight that were just nerves. You know, he kind of was short arming some shots and stuff. He's going to be. He's going to be great. He is going to be one serious player, and uh, thank goodness Houston has him. Okay, late in the first, Jeremy had a nice dish. He was in transition, and he was kind of like underneath the rim, basically. And he had a, he kind of passed the ball backwards to uh, Thomas Robinson for a dunk. That's, I believe that's Thomas Robinson's first in-game dunk with Houston. It was a great play. And you could see the two guys kind of shaking hands after. It was just a phenomenal play. Um, after that play, that was uh, that was two minutes and 35 seconds left. And the first, Houston was up by 12 points at that point. And Patrick Beverly came in then for Jeremy just so he could get his normal end of the first quarter rest. That's just the rotation that, that, that we know Coach McHale likes to play. Jeremy started the second quarter on the bench, and he was resting. And I think as well, I mean, look, this is normal McHale rotation. Jeremy plays about eight minutes, and then he comes out. And then a lot of times he might start Jeremy in the second, but sometimes he'll keep him out, just let him rest longer. However, what I think McHale was looking at in this game Milwaukee is a perimeter-oriented team. They're a lot like Charlotte in that regard. Everything starts with their perimeter guys, Brandon Jennings and Monte Ellis. So you need to shut those guys down. If you can shut them down, you stop their team. But if you can't shut them down, they can get into a groove, and that's kind of what happened tonight. I think Beverly was in the game to play defense, and he was doing a very good job. Uh, harassing, excuse me, those guards. He was doing better than Jeremy was, and that's okay. That's one of the things Patrick Beverly is on the team for. Again, he's smaller than Jeremy, at least in terms of his build. He's 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 less bulky than Jeremy. He's so he makes him quicker, and he was giving them a hard time. And I think that that's what Mikhail was thinking was. We need to slow down these perimeter guys. And so I have no problem with that. I think that that is that is smart. And it worked pretty well, uh, at least in its sound strategy. 
Okay, Jeremy came back into the game with 6.35 left in the second quarter, came in for Beverly. Uh, In the middle of the second, not long after he came back in, uh, Jeremy went through the lane, dribbling right to left, hit a nice little right-handed reverse on the left-hand side of the basket. And I've mentioned this before. A lot of times, shorter players will do reverse layups. And they'll do it because the rim shields off the shot blocker. In other words, the shot blocker can't get to, he can't, you know, the rim is between him and the ball. And so it acts as a shield. And that's what Jeremy did on that play. And it was a very smart play because, you know, the rim is its own thing and you are not allowed to reach your hand up through the net. That's goaltending. That's an automatic basket. So rim is, I think it's, I don't know, it's like 18 inches across. So you have a foot and a half and that can really help you to get an advantage against the taller defenders. And that's what Jeremy did. And it was a great play. A really good play and a good good uh, decision by him. Uh, late in the second, Jeremy had a nice pass to James Harden for a three-point shot from about 20 degrees left of the top of the arc. Uh, also late in the second, Jeremy missed a left-handed layup shot, and he got hit in the mouth, um, I think, on that shot. He had a bloody lip, and uh, he had to come out of the game. There's a rule in the NBA now. It's been around for probably about 20 years now uh, where if a guy gets bloody, then he has to come out of the game or they have to try. They have to fix it so he's not bleeding. And that's just to prevent you know, spread of diseases and this type of thing. Uh, so Jeremy got bloody. They took a timeout. He wasn't quite ready to come back in. So he came out with, I don't know, like a minute and a half left at, at halftime and uh and so I, he got fixed up, I guess, at halftime. He was fine. He started the third quarter. He had a nice steal early in the third quarter. Uh, he kind of helped down on a big man that was just caught the ball at the top of the lane. Jeremy uh, um, picked him really nice. He, uh, he missed a catch-and-shoot three from about 35 degrees right of the top of the arc early in the third, and then he missed a little floater in the lane at the top of the third. But, again, Those are two misses, but both of them were good shots. Both of them were good shots. And so, like I said, sometimes you're going to make the shots and sometimes you're not going to make the shots. But, uh, again, I have no problem with with his shooting percentage tonight because he took good shots. Um, Also early in the third, Jeremy had a nice one of his patented half-court passes. This one came to Chandler Parsons for a nice little dunk. And that was with uh, nine minutes and 10 seconds left in the third quarter. And that cut Milwaukee's lead to 62 to 59. And then again, early in the third, Jeremy had a steal, another steal where he came down to help out on the, on the post man. We've seen him do that number of different times. And it, he was able to get another steal doing that. Um, Jeremy came out of the game with three minutes and 30 seconds left in the third quarter, came out for Patrick Beverly, and Milwaukee was leading 72-71 to 71, uh, at that point in the game. Now, I made a note there just from what I was watching, as, as I mentioned a little bit earlier. Jeremy is an excellent defender, but when he's going to have trouble, it's with the little guys, with the, the, the short guys like Berea, uh, or, or Isaiah Thomas or Sacramento, or against guys that are pretty thin. Because, again, as the same way with Yao and the way Yao is built, Jeremy's built similarly. He's relatively lean up top, but he's pretty thick in the legs and the hips. So if you're, if, if you're built like that and you're going against somebody that's pretty thin in the legs, they're going to have an advantage because they can move their body quicker than you can. As I said, Jeremy's 190, 195 pounds. That's pretty big for his height. Yeah, there's a lot of guys that height, you know, 180 pounds. And that's a that's a disadvantage for Jeremy in terms of defending those guys. So 
But Brandon Jennings is a small guy. Monty Ellis is not a small guy he's in terms of height, but he's a lean guy. And it's hard to stay in front of those guys any for anybody. But if you're a little thicker in the legs, it's even harder. And so that was that was an issue somewhat for Jeremy tonight. Okay, Jeremy started the fourth quarter with Patrick Beverly. So uh, James Harden was was getting arrested. And so Jeremy at that point, I believe, was guarding Monte Ellis, who was the shooting guard for the Bucks. Early in the fourth, Jeremy had a nice uh, feed to Demo for a two-point basket. I actually did not get to see that play. I turned away for a second, and I missed it when I was writing notes. Also early in the fourth, Jeremy had a really nice uh, layup where we saw this the other day. I think it was in the Washington game. What happened was the the second defender was out of position, and Jeremy saw that. And basically what it meant was that the lane was wide open. So all he has to do is beat his defender, and nobody's back to help. And he saw that, and he went right by his guy for a nice little lefty layup. And I believe that Jeremy did that against the Wizards, and Nene didn't get over quickly enough to help, which is the Wizards' center. And so it's it was a good play, and it's good recognition, because Jeremy saw what the situation was, and he took advantage of it, which is really good. That put Houston up 86-83 to 83 with 10 minutes and 15 seconds left. After that, Jeremy had a nice little drive and dish to Demo, who got fouled and he shot two after that. Uh, I just made a note then that Jeremy is playing exactly the way that he should in this offense. It's not as flashy. It's not Linsani 1.0. He's not even necessarily going to get as many stats as he he could get, whether it's guys missing shots for blown assist or if it's a hockey assist, which is, uh, I think in hockey, if you make a pass that leads to another pass for a goal, you get an assist. That's not the case in the NBA. There's only one pass to a guy, and he hits a shot, and then you get assist. The second assist guy doesn't get an assist. So in this offense, Jeremy's, certainly his scoring is not going to be as high. But even his assist might not be as high. But that doesn't mean he's not playing well. We've seen this in Brooklyn, Washington, and this game tonight. The stats don't jump out at you, but he's playing well. He's playing well. I mean, the one stat you can look at certainly is assist to turnover ratio, which in this game was what? three and a half to one or three to one plus which is very good that's definitely good but that's why it's important to watch the game sometimes you cannot tell everything from the stat sheet and I like the way Jeremy's playing he's running the team well he's not perfect I mean he's, he's having some little ups and downs but he's he's playing as a pure point guard, as we talk about, he's playing to set other guys up and to make the offense run. He's not looking to score as much. And I'll tell you one thing he's doing really well is that he's being much more selective in when he shoots in terms of on his drives. In the past, he was shooting, shooting, shooting. A lot of the shots were getting blocked. As I said, he still has to adjust to you're you're not you know you're not playing against the Ivy League centers anymore. These guys can block your shot and they will. Early in the year he was doing a lot of that. Now he's not doing that. Now he's not doing that. And you'll see guys do this like Nash. He, there's times Nash will get drives to the lane. He's like wide open, but he passes it out. The reason why he's passing it out is because he's used to. The second defender, the center, being there to stop him. And so he's conditioned, I'm going to look for other guys. Well, that's what Jeremy's starting to do. And that's good. That's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. Let Jeremy get used to playing that way and let him get better 
at the floaters and teardrops and runners, then he can start making more shots and let him get better at shooting from the outside. I think Jeremy has made a conscious decision that he's going to be more careful about how he shoots when he gets in the lane. And that's great. That's good. It, and even if even if the stats don't look as good, it's smart basketball. And that's great. I'm really happy to see that. Uh, Houston struggled tonight on defense, as I mentioned earlier, and they particularly struggled when Omar Ashik was out of the game. And there was a stretch in this game where they were playing small ball, meaning going a little bit smaller with their personnel. And Demo was playing at center. And look, Demo's tall, but he's not a defender like Ashik is. And so when Demo was in and Ashik was out, Houston's defense was struggling. Although their offense was pretty good, which is the whole, if you go small ball, usually your goal is to outscore the other team. You're not trying to play great defense. You're just like, okay, we're going to score, and you, you, we'll see if you can outscore us. So it worked okay. It worked okay. Jeremy came out of the game at 7.45 left in the fourth quarter, but he was only out for a short period of time. He was out for like, he came back in at 5.30 left in the fourth, and that was probably just to uh, get him a little bit of rest for the stretch run. Um, he had a really nice play soon after he came back in. He drove to the left side of the lane. He did a stop move where he'll stop and pivot, but he didn't pivot. He just did a couple of fakes, like like ball fakes. You know, you, you push the ball up like you're going to shoot it, but you don't shoot it. He did like he did like two of those, and all of a sudden he was wide open. <laughs> it was just great. I mean, it's uh, and that can happen. That's why guys do fakes because sometimes you're just you'll lose your defender, and that's basically what Jeremy did there. And he just had a wide open layup, basically, and he hit it, and that put Houston up one hundred three to ninety nine with three minutes and forty seconds left in the game. Um. Then late in the fourth, with three minutes and 25 seconds left, Jeremy drove on the right-hand side of the lane, and he was forced into a really difficult shot. Kind of a – he was basically going out of bounds, and he had to heave the ball up. But it it turned out it was so – it went over the rim, and Omer Ashik caught it for an alley-oop. It it wasn't a designed alley-oop. it was a miss, but it was it turned out great. That put Houston up 105 to 99 again with three minutes and 25 seconds left. And unfortunately, after that, Houston pretty much collapsed because he, uh, Milwaukee scored the next six points. And as we said, they with 36 seconds left, the game was tied at 107, and Milwaukee took a shot and they missed it. And then they got the offensive rebound. So then they had, you know, they had the ball with like 20 seconds left. Shot clock's off because it's fewer than 24 seconds. And uh, as I said, Jeremy stopped Brandon Jennings, but Monte Ellis hit the the, the crazy fall away three pointer, and that was it. This game reminded me a lot of the game yesterday between the Sacramento Kings and the Miami Heat. It was a great game. I just happened to be watching it when in a double overtime Sacramento's not a good team but they got into a good groove and if you get into a good groove anybody can beat anybody and uh, that's what happened for Milwaukee tonight uh, it's unfortunate for Houston it's very unfortunate but um, you know like I said hopefully uh, they can do what they need to do and fight their way out. I actually just looked at the scores right now, and Utah did lose. So Houston is one half a game back of Utah. Utah's schedule is brutal for the rest of this season. So Houston is still in a good position to make the playoffs. They might finish at number eight, and the Lakers could finish at number seven. I I could see that happening. That's a possibility, but I don't care. As long as Houston makes the playoffs, that's success. Um, Okay, so the summary of this game, this is a very tough loss, but Utah also lost, so that's good for Houston. Jalen played well 
He played a solid game, and he played the way he should play. As a true point guard, and he looked less sick. That's a very good sign. As I mentioned, the Lakers are looking good for the playoffs right now. I think there's a very strong chance that they're going to make it, but they can make it, and Houston can make it if Utah keeps falling apart, which is what seems to be happening to them right now. Finally, the new guys are really going to help this team. Demo starting, T-Rob, etc. They're going to help, but it's going to be some growing pains, which is what you saw tonight. A little bit of discontinuity and the offense and just kind of guys not used to each other. And that's going to take time, but it's going to pay off. As I said, this is by far the most talented this team has been this year and the deepest. It just needs time to grow, uh, and it will. Okay, it's 11.43 p.m. right now here on the East Coast of the United States on Wednesday, February 27th which means it is 12.45 p.m. on Thursday, February 28th in Taipei, Taiwan. The next game coming up is uh, at the Orlando Magic on Friday, March 1st here in the United States, which means early Saturday, March 2nd in Asia. Uh, So guys will get a day off, get some practice, although they're going to have to fly probably tomorrow. I just realized I did not write down any comments or questions from the last video or two. Sorry about that. Um, uh, I just worked to probably try to do a a comments video tomorrow just to kind of uh, take care of that. But like I said, I've read what everybody has said. um, And I'm always, you know, I like, I just like to read what you guys say because it's interesting to me too. But um, look, like I said, it's a tough loss, but I'm happy Utah lost. That helps our team. We don't need to beat out the Lakers if Utah falls out. And that's what seems to be occurring at this point in time. So, great. All right. Your comments below. Thumbs up, thumbs down in this video. Give you the full information in the video description below the video player to um, game stories, game highlights, box score the game. And so you can come and join the CNM Facebook group if you'd like to do that. Uh, We have our 2,000 members and growing all the time there. I am Paul F. Villarreal, the NBA expert. Thanks a lot for watching Conservative New Media. We strive to be the number one Jeremy Lin YouTube fan channel. I hope everybody's doing great and having a great night or great day wherever you are at in the world when you watch this video. Take care, and we will talk to you soon. As I said, next game in two days, and I will try to get a comments video up tomorrow.